Welcome to church this morning. Please turn in your Zion's praises to song number 57. All creatures of our God and King, number 57. Oh, all creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Alleluia, alleluia. The burning sun with golden beam, the silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise him, oh, praise him. So 
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday School Hour this morning. For devotional this morning, please turn with me to John chapter 1, and we'll be reading verses 6 through 13. The lesson this morning is titled From Servanthood to Sonship. And there's a really big difference there. The lesson talks a bit about how we were servants, and we were under the law, and the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And I had to think of the prodigal son. When he left, he gave up his rights as a son. And when he was looking to return, he was looking to return as a servant, but the father took him back in as a son. A big mindset change and also just a really big rule change. He was expecting to come back as a servant. He came back and was greeted as a son. Let's read John chapter 1, verses 6 through 13. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So John the Baptist was an incredible man. Um, and it says right here, he was obviously here, he was here to point the way to Jesus, to be a, a one that would point people towards the light. Now it says right there in verse um, in the beginning there that he was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. Verse 6, John was chosen of God. He had a very important role. And his role here was very similar to what ours should be every single day. We're here not to turn people to us, but we're here to turn people to Jesus. Um, that is our calling each and every day. Verse 7, he was a witness for the coming Messiah. He was to turn people towards Jesus. He was sent to bear this witness, and he did it very, very well. Thousands of people. Um, verse 9, he preached that the light was coming. And I had to think here, John, in my mind, is kind of similar to one of our more modern-day missionaries, um, similar to somebody like Nate Saint or uh, Jim Elliott, who gave up everything, and we know that John did this as well later on. He gave his, he was, his life was taken from him gave up everything for the cause of Christ. They were there to spread the light, Jim Elliott and Nate Saint, and in doing so, they lost their life, but they gained a much greater riches. Verse 10, we're transitioning here. It's now speaking of Jesus. Uh, Jesus was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And I found it interesting that nature knew who Jesus was. The wind, the waves, um, everything listened to him, obeyed him. Even the, the devils that were in some of the people, they came out of it. The, they knew who Jesus was. And yet, the simple people who lived alongside of him as he grew up would not receive him as the Savior. Jesus came to his own people, and they just would not receive him as the Messiah that they were looking for. They were looking for a much bigger kingdom, an earthly kingdom. They could not see that Jesus was God, a lot of them. Verse 12, but to those who did receive him, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's for each one of us today. If we believe on Jesus, we become sons and daughters of God. We go from being a servant to the law to being sons and daughters of God. A big transition and a huge blessing that we have that we do not deserve at all. We're just so thankful that we were given this opportunity. In verse 13, they were not born of this, they were not born of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
It was only through God and through his plan of salvation. So think about this through, through this lesson a bit, from going from a servant to a son or a daughter of, of Jesus Christ. The rule that Christ has for each of us is to be like John a bit here. We're to be that light that points people to Christ and to what Jesus has done for each one of us. Let's bow our head for words of prayer. Father God, we thank you for today. Thank you that you have come to earth and given us your way of salvation. Lord, we thank you that you are here this morning. We pray that you would bless each one of our teachers this morning. Pray you bless a later service and pray that you would be among us this morning and give us words and, and ears to hear and words to speak. Pray that we would be open to your word this morning in our Sunday school lesson. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, the offering this Sunday is for the mission fund, and the offering next Sunday is for the trustee fund. At this time, we'll dismiss for class. Kindergarten and basement teachers out the back, and primary one and two out the front. Youth out the back. Junior and intermediate out the front. And the adults are dismissed as well. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to all of you, and I uh, also welcome your thoughts. I want to hear your thoughts um, as we discuss this lesson. <clears throat> so we're looking at Galatians chapter 3, uh, the background, the scriptural background is Galatians 3 and 4, and uh, our text is from verse 19 of chapter 3 to verse 7 of chapter 4. <clears throat> Law has its purpose in the world and in our lives. And you think about uh, what, what would it be like to live in a country without laws? It shows us what sin is and the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And Romans 7, Romans 7, uh, 13. <clears throat> Romans 7, 13 says this, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. And so the law, we see, shows the exceeding sinfulness of sin. It's good at that. It, the law is good at showing what sin is. What is right and wrong? 
and it shows our need for Jesus and his deliverance from sin. So the, the law is very good at showing us that, we, that we're lost. But it does nothing to save us because of our sinfulness. Because it's impossible. So when our sin abounded, grace did much more abound in Romans 5.20. And so the... Uh, The question, one of the most important questions ever, we could say, is how can man get right with God? How can man in our sinfulness become justified in good standing with the holy God? And that has been the question, that has been the question down through the ages. I believe all men struggle with that. And we are no exception. And so, so different, uh, you know, different people, groups through history have tried different things. Um, so, uh, you know, in the beginning, it was Abraham, and he he uh, did his sacrifices. And as time continued, the law was given in uh, the law of Moses. And so they tried that for a while, uh, keeping the law and sacrifices and so forth. The prophets pointed forward to the Messiah through that whole time. And so we see the, the, that theme all through Scripture is pointing to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ as the answer for the sin problem. That's, that's the problem. And, and so... We have here the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians, um, in particular, was addressing the uh, problem of what the Jews were were uh, promoting, that they had to keep the law, the, the law of Moses, in order to be saved, in order to be right with God. And not only that, they were they were um, pushing it on the Gentiles as well. So that was the question, the problem here that Paul is addressing in the, in the book of Galatians. How Jewish do, you, do we have to be? How Jewish did the church have to be in order to be saved? And uh, we might look at that as kind of a, uh, I mean, you know, we can't relate to that because we, we're not Jewish. We're not, you know, we're, we're, you know, we don't have to eat kosher and uh, keep the Sabbath day and all the Sabbath laws and so forth. But we have to understand that, that in the early church, the church was much more Jewish than what it is now, what we're used to as a church. In fact, the first the first uh, probably 10 years of the early church, it was, it was Jews who were saved, who were part of the church. And so I'd like to take us back to uh, some of the background of, of the letter of Galatians. And to do that, we, we need to go back to Acts. So uh, starting in Acts chapter 9, and... Uh, so the first 10 years approximately, we have, first we have, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have Pentecost, and then um, approximately 10 years pass, <coughs> seven to 10 years probably, between the first uh, chapter of Acts and chapter nine when Paul is converted. And this is all pointing towards um, the, the gospel coming to not is not just for the Jews. It was for the Jews first, and it still is. But it was for the Gentiles as well. And in uh, Acts chapter 9, this is Paul's conversion story. In verse 15, um, Ananias is speaking to Paul here. He, he says, He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. 
So that was Paul's commission from the start to go to the Gentiles. Not only the Gentiles, but it included that. And in verse 22, Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus. So I read that verse because just to show that Paul, after Paul's conversion immediately, he started preaching the gospel. And at this time he was in Damascus. Uh, he spent three years in Damascus or around that area. Uh, it says he went to Arabia as well, which <clears throat> we're not exactly sure where that was. That was, uh, so three years after his conversion. And then we come, and then, uh, so, Paul, being the writer of, of Galatians, is, is sort of the main character here. And so, um, so we see Paul, after his conversion, spend some time in, in Damascus, and then, then he, he was persecuted in Damascus, and then he went to Jerusalem. Not sure exactly how long he was in Jerusalem, but probably not very long. Um, according to Galatians, maybe, maybe uh, what does it say there, 14, 15, 14 days or something? He encountered resistance there, and from there he went to, um, it says Cilicia and Asia, I think, which I believe would have been, in the Acts, it says he went to Tarsus, which is where he was from, which was in Asia, Asia Minor. And so he stayed there. He didn't spend much time in Jerusalem for a good number of years, 14 years at least. And um, I'm just saying that just to show you that Paul was kind of in the background as far as Jerusalem was concerned. His mission was more... That, that's when he, you know, he, had, he went on his missionary journeys during that time, at least the first, first one, during that time. And then we find, uh, so, okay, so Paul is in the background there, preaching the gospel, the pure gospel that he got from Jesus Christ, it says he, he was as a revelation. And then, so I want, to, I want us to look at Acts chapter 10 now. <clears throat> Acts 10 is the um, is, is, is the story of Peter and the vision and Cornelius. And so, so th this vision was a miraculous vision that Peter had. And it was all, it was all to to prove, to show that the gospel was not just for the Jews, it was for the Gentiles as well. <clears throat> Verse 28 of Acts chapter 10. And so some of these verses we can see how unusual this was for the Jews or how, how the Jews had to change their thinking um, in order to think that the Gentiles could could be a part of the gospel. Chapter, uh, verse 28 of Acts chapter 10. Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But, but God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. It was against the Jewish law for them to sit down and eat with a Gentile. And in verses 34 and 35 of chapter 10. This is after Peter's vision and all those things happened with Cornelius. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And uh, verses 44 to 45. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them all which heard the word, and they of the circumcision, 
which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So these Jews, Jewish Christians, thinking that, you know, that they were, they sort of had a, a corner on the gospel, here witnessed basically the same thing that they experienced at Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Ghost and the, and the Gentiles obviously, you know, were Christians and spake in tongues and so forth. So then we come to Acts chapter 15. And so I'm, say, I'm, I'm looking at this just to show that, you know, these things were addressed. These things were settled. They should have been settled back here. Acts chapter 15 is the Jerusalem conference. Um, and Paul, Paul uh, was, you know, in Antioch. He was in, on his missionary journeys. He was not at Jerusalem other than he did come to Jerusalem to deliver, to deliver some money at one point. For the most part, Paul was not in Jerusalem. And what happened here was that there were actually Jews from Jerusalem that went to Antioch and were trying to persuade them that, they, that the Gentiles in Antioch, Gentile Christians, needed to keep the Jewish law in order to be saved. So they were not only... Uh, you know, not only believed that they themselves had to practice this list of things in order to be saved, but they uh, persuade. They started persuading the Gentile Christians as well that they needed to do these things. Um, in verse five of Acts chapter fifteen, it identifies these people as uh, a sect of the of the Pharisees. And to their credit, it does say, which believed. And so these were Pharisees who believed they were Christians. Um, Paul has some strong words for them, however. Paul, uh, in uh, Galatians, calls them spies and um, false brethren. And so they, they did have some bad intentions <coughs> in their, you know, forcing it on on others. So that's kind of a background. Um, <clears throat> and we could we could look at the at what happened here at the Jerusalem conference. Basically they all came together, including Paul and Barnabas, um, all the apostles, Peter, James, and John. Uh, that would have been James, the brother of the Lord, the Lord's <laughs> brother, James. The brother of John had already been uh, martyred at this point. They all came together. They all had input. They all decided that this is what we're going to do. We'll tell them uh, that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Kind of a scaled-down version of, of the Jewish law um, because of, you know, these things were still important. So that's how they addressed it, and they hopefully settled it. And then we come to the book of <coughs> Galatians, which is uh, what we looked at last Sunday. Our, uh, Sunday. our lesson last Sunday was Paul's defense of the gospel. And so Paul is addressing this question. this question of um, how Jewish how Jewish you need to be to, in order to be saved. And as, as we'll see, the answer is, as we know, our salvation is through faith in Christ, which then produces um, a life of fruits and works. And uh, it is not, not a list of things that we need to keep.
So a little background before we look at this lesson, um, a little bit of review from, from Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> 1 and 2. So Galatians 1, uh, up to 2 verses, verse 14, is, is basically Paul's uh, defense of the gospel, and he's relating some things, some things that have happened in his life and in history. Um, chapter 2, I believe, is speaking of the Jerusalem conference. In verse 1, it says he went up to Jerusalem. If you look at that, compare it with the book of Acts, um, it makes sense that that would, would be <coughs> when, he, when he went to the Jerusalem conference. He took Titus along, and um, Titus was a Greek. Titus was, um, and, and it says he did not compel Titus to be circumcised seems like he did that to, to make a point at the Jerusalem conference and to show, you know, that Titus was accepted as a brother even though he was a Greek, a Gentile, and did not, was not Jewish at all. And then uh, even, and he had some, had some words for Peter as well. Peter, Peter was uh, in verse verse eleven and twelve, <clears throat> Peter was um, was okay with the Gentiles, you know, ex uh, having the gospel. He was all okay with that, and yet his actions sometimes when he was with certain Jews that promoted this this other gospel, which Paul says is not a gospel, perverted, a perverted gospel, uh, even, even Peter kind of came under their influence, and even Barnabas. Um, verse 16, I think, is a key verse in verse 2. Now, this is getting into the doctrinal section here of Galatians. Galatians 2 verses uh, 15 up through the end of chapter 4 is, 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 is doctrinal. And in um, verse 16 of chapter 2, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In the end of chapter 2, if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. That's a pretty powerful verse right there. Think of all that Christ went through to suffer and die. And in the garden, you remember he said, he prayed, if it be possible, if there's any other way to bring salvation to man, you know, can't you find some other way? But there wasn't any other way. And... So that's the only way. It's not through not through the works of the law. And that brings us to chapter three. <clears throat> our uh, ver our text start in chapter three, verse nineteen. I think I'm just going to go ahead and read the first um, verses of chapter nine, of chapter 3 up to verse 19, and then we will take some volunteers to read the rest of this. So Galatians 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently sent, set forth, crucified among you? This only what I learn of you received 
ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? So we see Paul is, I think, frustrated because he had spent a lot of time and effort um, in, in his missionary journey preaching the, to the churches in Galatia the true gospel. Verse 5, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. I think we're going to see some more about Abraham here and the promise that was given to Abraham. And Romans chapter 4, we don't have time to look at that, but that explains that in more detail about how the promise that God gave to Abraham was given before the law, 430 years before the law was given. And it was even before before uh, Abraham was required to be circumcised. And so, you know, Abraham was justified by faith. He believed by faith, and that was all long before any of the requirements of the law. And through that, then, um, the, the promise was actually the seed being Christ. Uh, we see that in the end of verse 29. We'll get to that. Uh, so where was I here? Verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faith for Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man, the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us, from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now that Abraham and his seed were the promises made, he saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. <clears throat> In, in the entire history up till now, the, the law was in effect for only a, a relatively short period of time. It wasn't the entire time. And so what's the purpose of the law? You know, that's the whole question that it asks in verse 19. It's a good question. So let's look at, let's look at um, these verses. Who, uh, who will volunteer to read the first section here? Go ahead, Ivan. All under sin, Galatians 3.19. Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. 
Okay, let's keep reading here. Who will read in the next section? Go ahead, Michael. Verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Okay, and the last section. Ken. Now I say that the heir, that Moses is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. But as under two years and governors unto a time of appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Thank you. From servanthood to sonship, all under sin, all one in Christ, and sons and heirs. So the, back to the question again of how can men be right with God in light of our sin? So what was the purpose of the law? Maybe I'll open that up. Um, question one. The purpose of the law was to show man the sinfulness. I guess the question is, you know, what, why did why did God wait? What, we don't know. We don't know what the timeline from the from creation to the fall. I'm not sure what that timeline was. <coughs> what about, what about three thousand years from? Creation until the law was actually given. The law was given to show man their man's sinfulness. But why, why did God not choose to immediately bring Christ right after the fall? He could have. Did he wait three thousand years to show men how depraved they really were? I don't, you know, just a question. Yeah, I don't don't have all the answers as far as, I mean, God is sovereign and it says in the fullness of time. Um, and I think though that the, uh, the Jewish nation was called to, to show, to be a light to the Gentiles and specifically uh, the, the Messiah came through Abraham and followed the, follow the line the whole way through, down through the kings, um, started with 
with Abraham through the Jewish nation. And Jesus was Jewish as well. That's something to think about. The Jewish, did, Jew, did Jesus keep the law? I think the answer is yes. He observed. He observed. Um, he would have observed Jewish law. Uh, uh, obviously not to the point that the Pharisees were taking it. Um, and even today, the, the, the law... So what, yeah, we should clarify maybe what we mean by the law. Um, in, uh, in Matthew 5, Matthew 5, verse... Uh, I may not have written that, that verse down. Yeah, Matthew 5, verse 17. It says, Think not that I am... This is Jesus speaking. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So there was there was the moral law, uh, the Ten Commandments, and so forth. And and uh, you know a lot of good things how to relate to each other. I think those are the things that Jesus came to fulfill. Um, the Jews took this much further, much further than um, than they were supposed to. I'm, Any, I'm reading the book uh, Killing Jesus, and in there they talk about how the Pharisees and Sadducees would add a whole bunch of rules because it made them look wise. And I had to think about that. They, they added a bunch of things to the law, and eventually they weren't even following the law. They were following all these rules they had made. And I think Jesus uh, followed the original law, and that's why he was at odds with the Pharisees. Yes. Yeah, like you said it very well. Uh, at one point, I mean, Jesus had very strong words for a condemnation for uh, the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. And at one point he said, if you were the sons of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. They were doing all these works, but it didn't have anything to do with, with, uh, it was so far, so, <clears throat> so far off from the truth. And even today, the, there, there are endless debates all through history, the Jewish religion, there have been endless debates and commentaries written about what exactly it means, how to follow the law, the strict law. And uh, so anyway, I think when we're talking about the law here in Galatians, it's um, the... Uh, the law as God gave it in the Old Testament. And it was because of transgression. It shows us our sin. It shows guilt. <clears throat> you know, it's just like, to make it really simple, I mean, in my mind, is this being oversimplified, but if you don't have a law, you know, the Bible says there was no from Moses till the law was given. Nevertheless, death, death reigned all that time. It didn't change anything. Our sin was still a sin, but there was no penalty for it. So you can't charge somebody for something that is not a law, <clears throat> like our law here. If there's no stop sign, you can't blame somebody for going, for going for a stop sign. But an accident will happen just the same. But what it does, stop sign does, is make you guilty. You Now you know you're supposed to stop there. The law said, now this is what you stop. And before that, there was none. Just to go back to it. In the, before the law, people lied. It, uh, Jacob lied, and a bunch of men lied. And, and at uh, Jericho, she said that, you know, but there was no law against it at that time. So it was not a sin, because it was, it was still was a lie, but it was not a sin. And that's the way a law does. The law just makes it that we're guilty of it. <clears throat> if you go through a stop sign, at the intersection, no stop sign, they can't kill you. 
about the Buddha just dropped something. But you're still are just as dead as if you didn't. And so the law didn't make anybody righteous. It didn't justify <coughs> you, you know. It just made you guilty. And you, you're aware of it. <clears throat> I mean, that, that more can be said than that. That's pretty sad. <coughs> that's, that's the way it, the law is. <clears throat> yeah, so. You know, when I was a teenager, 18, my dad had a rule that yeah, I had to be home by 11 o'clock curfew. Uh, is that any use today, you know, for me today? No, I don't need it. <laughs> I don't know if that's sort of... Uh, in verse, 1 Timothy 1, there's some interesting... Interesting verses. It says, uh, verse 8, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. <clears throat> All right, we should move on here. Um, Because you are sons, on the verse before that, verse 5, you might receive the adoption of sons. Again, it's pointing to family. I believe that God looks at Abraham and the Jews as, fa as a family. They're a nation. They're his people, but they are a family. And we are adopted into that family. The, the, the verse came to me this week, I was thinking about it a little bit. Uh, God was in the world. No, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. To me, that was very profound. God reconciling the world to himself through Jesus. And we talk about the law, what's the purpose of it and all that. And, and we find here in these verses that the only way in is through adoption by faith. Yeah, so we have this uh, term schoolmaster, which could also mean guardian. And so we have a picture here of, of, uh, <clears throat> of a, young, a young person, a child, and as long as long as he is a child, he differeth nothing from a servant. So under that under that time, during that time, and you could apply that, I think, to the time in history when uh, the prophets were pointing forward to Christ, or possibly apply it to our lives. You know, times in our lives when we need structure, we need need that law in order to keep us from self-destructing. Um, but but uh, the ultimate <coughs> goal, the goal is for us to grow up through, through faith in Christ, through believing in, in Christ and adoption, adopt, uh, being adopted as a son into the family of Christ, the family of God. Uh, I should point out verse 28 there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for ye are all one in Christ and I think um, that's encouraging isn't it when we think about I guess I was thinking about you know the sometimes we disagree um, Christians seem to disagree uh, on exactly you know what <coughs> applications and so forth uh, but we are all one in Christ and we are all equally depraved 
and we're all equally saved. When you think about that, we have different backgrounds, different experiences. It's great to be, you know, I'm very glad, appreciate my Christian heritage. But, you know, that does nothing to save me. We're all one in Christ. Thank you for your help. You're dismissed. <coughs>
Good morning. Please turn in your Zion's praises to song number 482. Zion's praises, song number 482, Rock of Ages. Oh, rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the waters and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save me from its guilt and power. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill.
to welcome each of you to the service this morning. Uh, Arnold Martin is our minister, and we'll see what the Lord has given him. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we come before you with open hearts and minds, looking for the message that you have for us today. We know it will be a message of peace. We know it will be a message of hope. And we know that uh, you long to encourage us. And Lord, I pray your blessing on Arnold as he brings that message you have given him. Bless him with clarity, with peace, with joy in sharing your precious word. And may we, may we receive it with joy as well. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Well, good morning and greetings in Jesus' name. And Elmer noted a, a message of peace and hope. And we look in the Word of God, and we see the teachings of God. And the Bible points to Jesus Christ. That is a message of peace and hope. And I trust that can be relayed <clears throat> through me to you today from the Word of God. <clears throat> I would like to look in Psalm chapter 1. <clears throat> As we begin a new year, it is a convenient time to pause and consider our goals. <clears throat> Now, we do that all year, I hope. <clears throat> but there, we as humans, we live with time. We live with clocks. We live with calendars. And as a year rolls around, a month rolls around, whatever, it is a time period for us. At least for me, I think of that. I don't really make New Year's resolutions. <clears throat> but I think sometimes it's good to stop and say, well, what about the year that has passed? What about the year that is ahead of us? What is there for us and to uh, consider? We have been looking into the last few months the two kingdom concept. And Psalm chapter 1 is a very good example of that. There's a clear division between the godly and the ungodly in Psalm chapter 1. <clears throat> There's a clear distinction between those who seek God's ways and those who choose to walk in their own ways. We live at a time when leaders neglect the responsibilities of their position. Similar to empires of old, we observe moral decay that threatens our nation's stability. And it's not only this country, it is around the world. Does this cause us apprehension or uncertainty? You know, the godly focus on kingdom work. And that is the title to my message today, Focused on Kingdom Work. And I had to think of the, the work of God, the kingdom work. In a two-kingdom concept, there are those who walk with God, and there are those who do not. And that is the two-kingdom distinction there. And sometimes it's very, it's very evident. Other times it's more hard to define where a person is at. But ultimately, if we profess faith, and Jesus Christ, as our means and our access to, etern to eternity with God, we are on God's side if we walk in obedience. So I had to think as, as we look at a new year and we look ahead, do we as Christians, can we focus on the work of the kingdom of God? Or am I drawn to the affairs of this world? Now, I know we all are somewhat because we live here. And we're supposed to work, the Bible says, and we're supposed to take care of our families. So those parts come into play, and I understand that. But is, can our focus be on the work of the kingdom? I want to look at three things here this morning. One is, is the, uh, the word meditate. It's in, it's in chapter 1 here, and some other areas as well. Are we able to meditate on the word of God, and then to observe those in the past, and even fairly recent and current people, I'm sure, those who are willing to um, meditate on the word of God and let it prosper their lives so that they can carry out the kingdom work. Their focus can be on the kingdom work. And then thirdly, to maybe just to kind of close with, on what does my confidence rest? 
We, we live in a world that, is, um, that has much despair. There's anger. There's violence. Those are not things of God. But we as the people of God, we live in that realm. We live in this realm, in this world, in this created world. And we are to be those who are different. We are to be a peculiar people, a called out people. And that is possible, we know that, because others have done it. And in our own lives, to encourage us this morning to realize that, gain, that goal is obtainable. And in that, we can have a peace and contentment in this present world. That our work, our responsibility is not to the world around about us. It's not to our nation. Um, we are citizens of this country, if you will. But our primary citizenship is, is in heaven. And that gives us a sense of freedom. That we are not, our loyalty is not to uh, the government or our country. And that's good. Because throughout history, and I can look at some of these individuals who have been called out of their countries, and God has used them around the world, and it's still happening today. Um, the Sensniks are just back. Welcome, Elvin and Carolyn. Uh, they were over in Africa visiting their daughter, <clears throat> and uh, they're working in Africa. They have moved from here. So, you know, we have people around the world today, and it's been that way. That's the kingdom of God. It's everywhere. We as a people sometimes uh, may be disturbed by the stability of our country. I think of that. But I think in this year, maybe it's something I can hopefully let go of a bit. Not worry about the stability of our country and the chaos that's going on and say, this is frustrating, the things that are happening. No. We live in the kingdom of God. We can focus on the kingdom work and God has no problem with national borders, national alliances, and uh, leaders of lands. Throughout time, he has dealt with them and placed them at his free will. And he is looking for the people of his church to work in that atmosphere and to go wherever he asks us to go. <clears throat> Let me read Psalm chapter 1. Look at the, um, the clear distinction between individuals. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He should be like a tree planted by rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. <clears throat> Look at these verses a bit. <clears throat> and one thing I want to know here, those who meditate on the Lord prosper. Okay, that's some different verses I'll look at. You'll find that concept is there. But the, it says, blessed is the man. So you have a godly man. He does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The ungodly are those who are not following God. They have decided not to follow God. They're doing their own thing. And then you get their sinners as well. And I think you could maybe say mm -hmm. those who are deliberately disobedient. And you can have ungodly people who can be good people in our society. And they're, they're ungodly. But when you have sinners, that's even a, def, that's even a distinction from uh, people who are not saints. They're, they're obviously doing what is wrong. Okay? In, our, in our society, that, that is a different level of people, even amongst uh, the ungodly. <clears throat> and then you have those who are scornful. A scornful person is one who not only is chosen to walk away from God, but he is going to let God know it. We would say he thumbs his nose at God. He uh, lets it be known that he thinks God is a fool and that he's going to just do whatever he feels like. It is a person who is rebellious. And to observe someone like that as a Christian, it makes me fearful for them. Because I know 
as well as I can, Almighty God. <clears throat> we have a respect for God as the saints of God. We have a appreciation for God's love and salvation plan. And we recognize that's a privilege to walk as a people of God. It's an opportunity. And to be ungodly should make us fearful. But to deliberately sin and then to mock and scorn Almighty God uh, is only pleasing to Satan. And then a sharp contrast, but to God, his delight, or sorry, in the righteous man, his delight is in the law of the Lord. So this blessed man, he doesn't delight in the things of the world, he delights in the things of God. And it says, he doth meditate day and night. To know God is a good master, to desire the knowledge and the wisdom that God has to give us, to seek it out and to recognize that it benefits my life, it makes me a better person. It gives me a sense of confidence when I walk in a world that is sinful. To delight in that law. And we talked about the law this morning in Sunday school. And the law can be viewed as a negative, depends how we look at it. But yet Christ said he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. <clears throat> so the law is a positive thing. And here, those who delight in the law and seek it out, or finding the ways that God has directed us to walk. It's like knowing the rules of a, uh, of a game or the rules of a uh, piece of machinery if you put it together. You want to know how it runs so that it operates efficiently and effectively. So you seek out uh, the guideline or the direction book or whatever, and you figure out what makes it tick. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Yesterday, I was playing mechanic uh, not of my own choice, but uh, my vehicle died. Battery was dead. And nowadays, these batteries, they kind of go dead. Uh, used to be, back in the old days, it would grind on for about a month, and you'd kind of think about it for a while. No, Friday it ran, and Saturday morning it would not start. Done. And uh, if you work in new vehicles, at least my Ford Escape, you find the battery is buried back under the firewall somewhere. And it used to be in all my other vehicles I've ever had, you just you know, unbolt the top, one out, one in, good to go. It takes about 15 minutes. Most took me probably about two hours. Uh, an experienced mechanic might have taken him half an hour. Anyway, so the laws. So I was going on YouTube, and you can ask my wife, I was probably in four times, you know, until I got this step done that I, you know, I forgot, okay, and this doesn't work here. And then they should oh, you do this. You know, it, it, the car is here this morning. So I guess that <laughs> says enough. But uh, I had to have some direction. Okay, I needed some guidelines um, to move forward. And it benefited me. Because there was different things I probably would not really have figured out right without that. Well, so is God's word in our lives. We're a lot more complex than a car battery. Uh, our lives and the world around about is a lot more complex. We need some direction. That's not a bad thing. That is a good thing. And God gives us his law. He shows us how to walk. And for those of us who seek it out, it is a delight. And we should meditate on it. And I challenge myself with that. Uh, I can always say I could do more. You know, to search out the ways of God. To know how it applies to our lives in the situations that we face. I mean, what will I deal with tomorrow at work? I'm not sure. We don't know. The things pop up in our lives, uh, situations, relationships, and how we respond to people and, and uh, events that occur. That's what we learn from the Word of God. It gives us direction. So to meditate on that is good for us. And it, it blesses us, like in verse 3 there, it gives the, uh, the results. Nourishment for the soul, you might say. We're like a tree that, that is by the water. It, it grows, it prospers. I think when I lived at home, <clears throat> we used to go down to the creek to go swimming, um, one time my mother even jumped in. That's another story. <laughs> but they had willow, those weeping willow trees down there. Then they grow near the water. They would, they would prosper. They were, they were like right there rooted in, you know, it was moist down there. Rooted down in where the moisture was. And they did well. And we know we have to water trees and stuff. We want them to grow. But we were like 
you know, if you meditate on the Word of God, our spiritual life is going to have that nourishment, and it can be prosperous, and it can grow. Accomplishing the service, our, the service of God on His schedule. It says, bringing forth fruit in His season. You know, God does not expect us to be doing above and beyond what is possible. You know, if He gives us, if he gives us five talents and we're a five-talent person, then that's what we should return. If he gives us any one talent and we're a one-talent person, then he expects one talent return in his time, in his way. But as we are nourished by God, we bring forth that fruit in our time. We're not withering, we're not fading away. And then it says there, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And to me, that is a very, that's an encouragement, encouraging note. That is, we meditate upon the Word of God. We, we seek God's ways. He will prosper us and direct us. Verse 4 is another contrast. The ungodly are not so. Now, it's just talking about all these good things in verse 3. So why are the ungodly not so? The question was raised in our class well, why would not everyone receive the truth and follow, receive the blessing? And that's a good question, I guess. There are various answers to that. You know, people are attached to their, their ways, I guess. But the ungodly are missing these blessings because they are not looking for God or the ways of God. They are without substance. They just easily are blown away. They have no stability in the word of truth. They have no stability in the real things of life which is the eternal, the spiritual things, not the physical stuff. The world we know roots themselves in the, in the physical things of the world, and they are unstable. Now again, we do some of that as well, out of necessity. Do we do it, do we uh, root ourselves in the things of this world to a fault? In other words, do we, uh, we say, well, we need them, that's true. Do we know where to stop? <clears throat> I'll leave it at that. That's not really my notes here, but anyway. To think about that. <clears throat> Can we become like the, the shaft, which is easy? Are we rooted in God or our things? And it says, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Or they're going to be declared guilty. When the judgment day comes, when God is you know, dividing the sheep and the goat, they're going to, they're going to be guilty. They are those who have not received the Son of God. They will not be recognized or known by God the Father. They will be rejected. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. I was looking at Matthew Henry's commentary a little bit. He said, it's possible that sinners can sit in the congregation on earth. But in the heavenly kingdom, there will be no sinners in the congregation of the righteous. God will weed those out. In other words, it's possible you and I can sit here in sin on a pew today. But we will not sit in the kingdom of God. We will not sneak in. There will be a clear definition there. Why? Because of this verse 6 says, The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. <clears throat> God knows his people, and those who are not his people will not be in eternity with him. So thinking here, I do not want to dwell on the, uh, on the negative side here. That I was not going to look into that a whole lot. Um, what that list of my notes here? I don't plan to spend time on the ungodly. They speak for themselves. Okay, but we have a definition there. We know the ungodly and the people of God. So the saints of God, in, verse, in chapter 1 here, or those who seek out the ways of God, they meditate upon his word because it interests them. I have a desire to know about God. I have a desire to know more about God. Therefore, I will meditate on him because it's my natural interest. And I can say for myself, like yesterday, okay, so I, I do most of my studying on Saturday. I try to get an outline, but in place, then I kind of put it together. I usually don't, don't feel like doing that. Okay, yesterday, I had other things I was doing. I didn't, I didn't really feel like sitting down to study. But inevitably, when I sit down and study, and I get into the Word of God, and I see this piece, how it fits with this piece, and after a while I become intrigued, 
So the next time I have to sit down and study, I say, okay, just get at it, and you will enjoy it. And that's true. You set aside time to do it, and it can be enjoyable. But it, it takes some self-discipline on my part. I don't know about you. <clears throat> Thinking here of meditating <clears throat> on the Word of God, <clears throat> and that's the one point I would like to make, to meditate on God's Word. Just looking at a couple other verses and you need not turn to these if you don't want to. This is in Joshua chapter 1, 8, familiar verse. And uh, <clears throat> direction here says, This book of the law shall not depart out of my, thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So some of the same thoughts come through there from Joshua about meditating day and night and prosper and success as a result of that. So as I looked at some of those verses, I thought, well, I, I guess that's true, right? That's true. So if I want prosperity, if I want success, I know what to do. I meditate on the Word of God. I draw closer to God. That takes effort on my part. <clears throat> Psalm 77, <clears throat> verse 10 to 12, says this. And this is kind of a response here to um, difficulties that um, were being faced. <clears throat> this was from Asaph, I believe. Challenge that he had. He said, <clears throat> and I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord, Surely I will remember thy works of old. I will meditate also on all thy work and talk of thy doings. So, you know, he was looking back at what God had done before. And that does me good to do that, you know, to observe. And that's one thing I'm looking at some, I'm going to look at some Old Testament figures this morning. But to look back at what God has done and to realize that his power was sufficient for them. And that his power is still alive and well today. And what he promised then was done. What he promised for me and in the future will also be done. So as we meditate on the word of God, we see these promises. And that's what the writer here was saying. He can look back and see that. And he was going to meditate on it. And then he was going to talk about it. You know, that's the sense we're doing today. That's what we do in Sunday school. We sit down with brethren and we talk about the things of God. And we encourage each other. We share it with others. To me, that, that's a blessing. It's a positive to enter in with the people of God and people of like beliefs and people that we know care about us because you love God, therefore you love me. Otherwise, that wouldn't be really desirable. And I think we all can say that. As we love God, we value our fellow man and we, we value the, the brotherhood Brothers and sisters worshiping together. We can sit and we can talk together. <clears throat> Psalm 143, 5 says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the works of thy hands. Uh, the word muse is similar to meditate, maybe a little deeper. It's to, to consider something deeply, to muse upon it. Like you're sitting there and you're working it through your head. Again, he's remembering the days of old. He's remembering God's faithfulness and claiming it for himself. Also in the New Testament, Paul speaks to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, verse 13. And Paul is encouraging Timothy, he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. <clears throat> Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. So again, you have the idea of profiting from meditating in the word of God. Now he says, so others could profit. That thy profiting, others could benefit from that, which I think is the general principle of prosperity or profiting. So we see the value of meditating. 
if we're uncertain about life, we stop, we look into God's word, we think about it, we meditate upon it, and we let God speak to us. In our own corner, wherever it may be, in our own private setting. But also, as the psalmist there noted, when, when we receive the promise and you know, if I'm refreshed and recharged, that I then talk to others, and that we encourage each other, we lift each other up. That as we go into a new year, in a country, in a world, really, it's becoming, the world's becoming pretty much uniform. It's being drawn together in many ways. We live in a world that has a lot of trials and decisions that are being made. You think, why in the world would anyone ever go to this length. <clears throat> really, I'm, I'm sometimes shocked to the extreme of, uh, of Satan's influence on the world, <clears throat> how much it has been allowed to proceed. But we as Christians, that is not our realm. That is not my home. And in a sense, it is not my responsibility. Okay? My responsibility is to live faithfully, to follow the truth, to seek it out, so that when God needs me, when God needs you to stand up as an individual of faith and to make a statement for the kingdom of God, that we are ready to do so. Okay? Those who practice godliness. I want to look at some of these men. They're familiar figures. Also a lady in here. But the question I have before I look at individuals who walked with God in their time, and some of their situation that they were in, um, to say how to measure prosperity. I've talked about being prosperous when we meditate upon God. Now, how do we measure that prosperity? Many times we measure prosperity in physical measurements, whether in possessions, our lands, our finances. I don't think any of them are really included when God talks about prosperity. When he's talking about meditating upon his word, that it will prosper us and make us successful. Now, it may be a fringe benefit. We know that, like Abraham and Job, they were wealthy. Okay? When they obeyed God and followed his commands, that was one of the blessings that followed. But that is not what we are to seek after. So the prosperity um, is to have that measure of faith and confidence in God, to be content with what God has given me. So as I meditate upon his word and I study the way God wants me to walk, I can have a peace that where I am at today is where God wants me to be. See, to me, that is prosperity. Then I can go about my life and many activities with confidence. And in spite of what's happening around me, I know that God is in charge. So when we have mandates and things like that, um, how do I respond in a Christian setting? Okay, I can respond as a Christian as a child of God, not because I'm trying to manipulate some other outside <clears throat> entity. Content in spiritual victory. God's kingdom will prosper when his people prosper, when they walk faithfully. <clears throat> so looking at some individuals here, and I'm going to look at I'm not even going to dig into this, kind of review them a bit. Moses and Joshua, maybe as one. Joseph, Ezra and Nehemiah, also kind of as a group. Uh, the Shumanite woman, Paul, <clears throat> Gideon, and Daniel. Just make some comments on them a bit. They worked for God anywhere in the world, these individuals. Um, some are worse than others. The Shumanite woman might have been more set there in northern Israel somewhere, but the rest, they kind of went wherever God asked them to go. And to them, that was their priority in life. They had, they had sought out God's ways, and they were open to God's direction, and he took them in, in adventures in life, if you will. So just kind of thinking of these a little bit. Moses and Joshua, <clears throat> um, one question I had as I looked at some of these individuals in the Bible, we're never really told most times what they were taught or who taught them. But we know that they were taught because of how they lived. Take Joseph, for example. 
when he went down to Egypt, we know he was taught in the ways of God because he lived them out. But there isn't really a record of how he was taught. We, so in a sense, we assume some of that was in place. So those were like Moses and Joshua. Now Moses, we know, was educated by the Egyptians. So he was an educated person according to world standards. Joshua, not so much. Um, but both of them were taught in the ways of truth. We know Moses was given back to his parents, and they would have taught him the ways of God. So they knew God, and they crossed borders. So Moses, you know, went from the desert back into Egypt, and then later moved out, and Moses and Joshua went through the deserts over uh, south through Moab, up around the, the east side of the Dead Sea, and came into Israel. So they were traveling around the Middle East. And one thing that comes to mind is that, as I mentioned earlier, if the land in which I live is unstable, I can have a sense of uncertainty and apprehension. But here we have men who were traveling about. It didn't matter if the nation that they were in was failing. God was going to use them where he wanted them at the time he wanted them. And he put them from this place to this place, and he established his kingdom through them. He taught, he directed, he established his family line, if you will, through these individuals. So they knew God. They were willing to cross from country to country. Um, I have a sense that if the United States fails, it would be a great shock to our systems. And it probably would be. But it's happened before. Countries have fallen before. And the Christian church within there um, still is walking with God. So not to put our confidence in men, we should not, to put our confidence in God. And that comes from meditating upon the truth. Moses and Joshua, did they, were they prospered? Yes. And I think here, I made notes here, I have a, two columns, if you will. Were they prospered in the ways of God? Yes. Did they prosper in the ways of the world? Um... Not really. Moses, when he left, you know, one time he was in the royal family in Egypt. When he died, he was out in a mountain in the wilderness. I'm not sure where he died, but... So they prospered in the ways of God. But they gave up a lot of that when they followed God and walked through the desert. <clears throat> Joshua, of course, ended up in the promised land. Joseph. We also, he was taught by God. He also crossed borders. He was taken from his home uh, against his will and made a servant, and he was a prisoner. But yet God prospered him. Uh, it notes that, actually the word prospered, and what I read there in Psalm 1, is reference back to Joseph in Genesis. In Psalm 1, verse 3, it says, Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. In my margin, that reference is back to Joseph in prison and with Potiphar. And it says there that God prospered him, or he, he prospered him in the eyes of his, cat or his jailers or whatever. Or words, God lifted him up. And God can do that, did it then. He can do it now for any one of us. If we follow him faithfully, he will prosper our attempts when we do his will. He will, he will have his work carried out, even though to me it may seem impossible. So Joseph going to Egypt as a servant and as a slave and as a prisoner, had little, national, had little hope for national power. But God raised him up and put him at the head of that country, second behind Pharaoh. Was he prospered spiritually? Yes. Did he prosper materially? Yes, he did. He was like the uh, leader of the land until he, you know, until he died. So he was blessed with, uh, with both spiritual and physical prosperity. How about Ezra and Nehemiah? Ezra and Nehemiah are in a similar time span. When, um, when Israel was taken captive and taken down to Babylon, and then they were allowed to return, again, as prophesied and as God directed, they were allowed to return. Ezra was more so the priest of the group, and there were some different groups there. I won't get into that, really, but so there was a little time span going on. But Ezra was the leader of the spiritual. He was the we would say the priest or the minister. Nehemiah more so the leader of the land. And he came, we know him as far as rebuilding the wall. 
Ezra dealt more with the uh, spiritual issues, and they says kind of work together. We know they maintained their faith when they were down in Babylon. And I'm not sure their ages. I'm not sure if they were born in Babylon or if they were down as captives and then came back. We know that Daniel, you know, was taken from Israel as a captive, and as far as you know, he perished, he died in Babylon. But Ezra and Nehemiah, when they came back, they again were crossing borders. There was not stability of a country as we know it today. They were taken from one point to another. They knew God. They followed God's commands. We know that Nehemiah, when he was asked what he was sorry for about, he wanted to go back and rebuild Jerusalem, the city of God. And he was given that okay to do so. Did they prosper spiritually? Yes. Physically? Uh, not really. If you read, I mean, Nehemiah, he says numerous times, he says, remember me, O Lord, for the good I've done unto this people. It sounded like he was weighted under and didn't know what to do numerous times. Um, so maybe, in, you know, from their viewpoint, things were not always going well. But they were doing the work of God, and they were successful in that, and God prospered their plans. How about the Shumanite woman? <clears throat> 2 Kings 2 I don't think there are people who practice godliness because of what they believed or what they saw, the truth. The Shumanite woman saw Elisha traveling back and forth, and she made him a place to stay. And um, was she prospered? Yes, in the sense that she responded as God would have her to help the prophet of God. Was she prospered materially? Yes. We know Elisha raised her raised her son, and also he aided her when there was a famine. Now, he warned her to go, and when she came back, her land was returned to her again. Uh, Elisha was involved in helping her. So she prospered both ways, <clears throat> that she faithfully conducted her work as well. Paul, we know, stepped away from a position of power, from prestige. He, had to, he could have lived a life of ease. He was at the top. Apostle Paul. Um, we know he crossed borders. He was all over the known world, up into Asia Minor, ended up over in Rome eventually. He traveled about. Okay, as he understood the word of God, he was taking the truth around the world. He was not confined, confined to one spot. Did he prosper spiritually? Yes. Um, physically, no. He would have lost out on much of what he would have had at one time as far as the physical measures. And there's a couple here yet. Uh, Gideon entrusted God when his life was at stake. Gideon, when it was just minding his own business, Gideon was out grinding wheat, hiding from the, uh, what was it, the Amalekites? I don't know, the Midianites, I believe. So he was hiding away, grinding his, his wheat. And God just kind of came and called him out and said, You know, I, I need you, oh mighty man. He said, What, me? You must be someone else. You know, but when God wanted him, and that story is interesting if you read about Gideon, how God came to him numerous times and gave him just gentle prodding to the point that one time he went, snuck over behind the enemy's tent, and they were, there's enemies inside the tent, didn't know he was there. We're having, we're explaining a dream that they had about Gideon performing some great deed or whatever. You know, could not have been by chance. And uh, he eventually was encouraged to say, okay, Lord, I believe you. And of course, he had the fleeces and things like that. But he went and did it. But if he would have been on his own, he would have been killed. They would have executed him. But he was doing the power of God. He was victorious. Did he prosper spiritually? Yes. From where he started, I'm saying a month or two later, when they actually carried it to battles, yes, he prospered spiritually. He took the word of God. He did it. He took God's direction. Did he prosper physically? Um, maybe so. He was kind of the leader of Israel after that. He ends in a few uh, questionable notes, but that's maybe another story. But all these individuals, they were open to God's plan. They were willing to sacrifice the world's goods. They were willing to move about as asked. Were they content? I believe so. We know Paul was, he notes that. So to meditate upon the word of God and to observe those who 
have applied that truth to their own lives. We can be encouraged today. What is God calling you and I to this year? We don't know that. But we know that if we're walking with God, He is waiting to prosper us. He's waiting to guide and direct us. He wants us to step up, and He will aid us in His way. So on what does my confidence rest? <clears throat> As I view God's saints, the list could continue, right? I could talk about the Reformation believers. I could talk about uh, Hudson Taylor, Eric and Liddell, went to China back in the 1800s. I could talk about George Mueller. And if we went to recent, I could talk about Richard Ball, could I not? The faithful saint of God. And what about those of us still living? There are, God's remnant is always with us. I, I look at Richard Ball many times, and I, I think, what a man of God. When I think, you know, I think of him working down in Philly, I think of his involvement in Guatemala, and I don't even know what he was doing as deacon of his church. I saw very little of that. I'm sure he did much there. What a saint of God. It was a privilege to know him. You know, he could be right on this list, right? And numerous other people who are faithful today. <clears throat> So to consider, do my possessions anchor me down to where I'm at? <clears throat> and that's why with Richard Ball, it did not seem to be the case in his life. <clears throat> he was not anchored by his possessions. Is change a threat or an opportunity? And I know, did the saints like change? That list I just went over. Like Joseph, I think, would have rather just stayed where he was at. <clears throat> I don't think his means of change really appealed to him where he was sold as a slave by his brothers. Uh, Daniel was taken by force down into Babylon. Okay, many of them went against their will. We know Moses argued a good bit, saying, I cannot do this job, I'm not, I'm not qualified. I don't think they like change either, any more than you or I do. If I have things change in my life, I try to fix them so they're like they were before, for the most part. I mean, there's some things, obviously, we, we try to change um, that we don't approve of. But many things in my life I'm comfortable with, I don't want them to change. I want them just to stay the same. And God is way of changing us and moving us. Is that an opportunity or does it threaten me? And honestly, in my life, it probably threatens me. So I speak to myself. Is my confidence in God... The national borders or alliances scare me. Does the instability of our country uh, make me fearful? Maybe it concerns me. It doesn't really make me fearful because I think it's God's plan unfolding right before our eyes. Stuff we see going on in this world. Stuff that was prophesied to happen. So to focus on kingdom work is a challenge for myself today, to meditate, to learn of God. God can prosper me. He can prosper you. To recognize the saints who have experienced success and the faithful right up to our time, those who have um, known God, who have meditated on his ways, and that he has been able to direct their lives, that they have seen success. That should encourage me to do the same thing. To challenge me today to step out <clears throat> to do the kingdom work. To seek it out and to know God's direction. <clears throat> Christ says in Matthew 28, <clears throat> He says, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. You know, He said that first in the Great Commission. All power is given unto me. It has always been His and it always will be. So when his work goes forth, it's going to succeed, no matter what a national leader may say. So we know that. And then he says, go ye therefore. Where does he want to send us? Teaching them to observe all things. <clears throat> also, Christ says in Matthew 11, he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Okay? It says that right in there. And learn of me. 
Meditate upon me, if you will. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That's where I want to be. That I can, as I take the yoke upon me, that Christ is there <clears throat> helping me carry it, and it will feel light and easy. And that his work will be done through me. 2022 is in God's plans. Nations falter, yet God reigns. We don't walk alone. We, uh, we accept the work together. Whether it's Blue Ball Congregation, Mid-Atlantic, or the church around the world. Uh, if we have to walk alone, we often fall and we're fearful. That we have faithful brethren to walk with us, and we have a, a faithful God to guide us, we can step forth and take up the work. We can be anchored in truth to study the Word of God, and God will prosper our efforts anywhere on earth. May God bless you as you step into 2022. Let's kneel for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you today. I thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, his presence in this world. Lord, as we looked in the uh, Sunday school lesson this morning about the law, and it was put in place until Christ could come. Now, Lord, we have experienced that. In our time, we can look back on that history and say, thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice on Calvary, for your power over death, your resurrection, and the promise of your return someday. And Lord, as we walk with you as your children, as heirs to the kingdom, much more than we deserve. I thank you, Lord, for that great gift. And Lord, I just pray for your guidance in our lives as we, we live in a world that we see the influence of Satan round about us. Yeah, Lord, we know your influence is also there and that your power and might are above all. And Lord, as you direct us in your ways, give us courage to take up the challenge. And Lord, especially as brethren working together, Lord, that we can take up the challenge of the kingdom to focus ourselves on the kingdom work and what you would have us to do. Lord, you desire your people to have an open heart and open mind and to be looking, to be seeking out your ways. So may you give us understanding and direction in the time in which we live, that we can walk faithful and accomplish your purposes. I thank you, Lord, for faithful brethren here. May you continue to guide us each as we... Um, we feel vulnerable many times, and Lord, uh, we're uncertain what the future will hold. And Lord, we do not know that, but you do. So just give us that sense of confidence that we can seek your word, meditate upon your word, that you may empower us, enable us to go forth from day to day. We ask your guidance, Lord, as we go from here, that we can serve faithfully, and that Blue Ball Church and the churches around this area and the church around the world may put forth your teaching and uh, accomplish your purposes that it may not return void the uh, word that you send out. So thank you, Lord, again for your blessings. May you guide us as we go this week. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the Zion's praises, please turn to song number 251. The Banner of the Cross, number 251.
When the glory comes to